Hi everybody, Ian Bremer, and a quick take to kick off your week. It's everything, everywhere, all the time in terms of geopolitical risk uh, in the environment right now. Uh, pretty much everywhere you look, uh, we have increasing conflict, but the Middle East is still taking up more of my time than most things. Uh, in part, that is because we are awaiting what kind of an Israeli response there will be to those Iranian attacks, the 180 ballistic missiles that were sent uh, towards and into uh, Israel a couple weeks ago, uh, at the same time that the war uh, in Lebanon uh, continues to escalate between Israel and Hezbollah. Uh, maybe start uh, with the Iran side. The big news right now is a couple of pieces of information from the Americans. First, that the U.S. is sending over a THAAD missile defense system along with 100 U.S. soldiers uh, to operate it to Israel to improve Israeli air defenses against uh, incoming uh, attacks from outside the country. And secondly, that the U.S. Treasury Department has announced additional sanctions um, against uh, tankers uh, that have shut off their transponders and are helping the Iranians to illegally export significant amounts of sanction breaking oil. Um, prices uh, can go up on the back of that, an unusual thing for the Americans to do a few weeks before the election, uh, but shows just how concerned they are about potential escalation in the region. So let me give you some context here. First point, uh, on the one hand, the Americans have sent THAAD systems to Israel before, so it's not like there aren't any American soldiers on the ground operating in Israel. This is not such a game changer. In fact, uh, such a decision was made not only years ago, but also after October 7th. Um, but it is notable that it comes a year later on the back of a potential significant escalation, both in the northern front uh, that we're already seeing and with Iran that we might be. Uh, second point uh, is that uh, the, uh, the oil prices continue to be a little bit under 80 bucks. OPEC has a lot of spare capacity they could put on the market. China continues to have pretty poor numbers in terms of demand. So this isn't likely to have the American move to hit more Iranian oil, isn't likely to have a lot of impact in terms of oil prices. But if the Americans could have stopped what is right now 1.5 million barrels of Iranian export, if they could have taken that down, and the Iranians are using that money to pay for um, the axis of resistance that's targeting not only Israel, but targeting ships um, in the Middle East, targeting American and UK military um, assets. Why did Biden wait? Uh, you know, sort of why, why is it only being announced now? And why is it only being announced now in a way that seems to be a gimme for the Israeli prime minister and his government uh, in return for not engaging in significant retaliatory escalation against the Iranians. Uh, this is a U.S. policy that continues to look very weak, that continues to be out of step with most of its allies at this point. You know, you see um, even French President Macron uh, saying that he doesn't want to provide um, any more military support for Israel. Of course, it's easy for him to say that he doesn't provide much to begin with. If it was a significant export, I'm sure Macron wouldn't be saying that. But nonetheless, uh, the Americans uh, are, are on, on really one very uh, isolated side at this point compared to uh, the rest of the international community, whether you like the United States or you don't. Um, and their ability to influence the Israeli government um, appears to be virtually zero. Um, and and that, that has been shown um, with the recent attacks by the Israeli Defense Forces against UN peacekeepers in Lebanon. Um, and we've seen that on the back of those attacks uh, that the United States, uh, France, Spain, uh, Italy, which is a strong right-wing government, but also has a thousand peacekeepers on the ground in Lebanon, all strongly condemning the Israelis for making these attacks, but not prepared to actually do anything um, in in response. 
uh, and certainly not making the Israelis feel like they need to stop. Now, the Israeli perspective is uh, these peacekeepers um, uh, have not been capable uh, of um, upholding Security Council resolution that required that Hezbollah pull back uh, from the border area, a buffer zone that they've been launching uh, military strikes against Israel. Um, and that also uh, Hezbollah fighters um, are essentially using the presence of the peacekeepers um, as shields and that they're operating not on the peacekeepers' bases, but in proximity, which makes it harder for the Israelis to go after them. Um, that certainly doesn't justify firing directly on uh, the peacekeepers' base, uh, which has happened and which now the IDF says is a mistake. In return, the Israeli prime minister has uh, called on the UN secretary general to withdraw the peacekeepers. I find it implausible that the Israeli prime minister doesn't realize that the secretary general has actually no authority uh, over the peacekeepers. They're sent there on the basis of the Security Council. So in other words, if, if the Israeli prime minister wants to make a demand, he's making it uh, of the permanent members of the Security Council, like the United States and, and China and France, the UK and Russia. And he apparently doesn't want to make that statement. But, but again, the point here is the comparative impunity. Um, and uh, the, the, the major headlines, of course, uh, are uh, in the last 24 hours uh, around four Israeli uh, soldiers uh, that have been uh, targeted and killed, uh, as well as a large number of injuries um, on Israeli military base by Hezbollah drones. Uh, Hezbollah is much more capable than Hamas has been, and there will be more significant Israeli casualties um, as this war continues. But most of the casualties, of course, even though it's not most of the headlines, uh, will be uh, among the Lebanese, among the Hezbollah fighters, um, and among the Le Le Lebanon civilian population, of which we've seen about 2,000 killed uh, so far. And that is because the military dominance in the region, again, both offense and defense and intelligence and surveillance, uh, is overwhelmingly in the hand of Israel. So if there's going to be significant escalation in the war going forward, that escalation is uh, will be decided uh, overwhelmingly by the Israeli government. Um, and so that's that's what's particularly interesting to watch over the coming weeks. I am not expecting very much um, against Iran, frankly. The fact that the Israelis have already waited for a couple of weeks takes a lot of the urgency out of that. The fact that the defense minister, Yov Gallant, has said it will be the time of our choosing and what we do, they'll know that it was us, but they won't know how we did it, um, implies something that is um, a, a, more, a much more targeted attack um, than lots and lots of bombs raining down against, you know, sort of a nuclear facility um, or um, against uh, oil uh, production. Uh, it would not surprise me if it was a high-level assassination, uh, for example, against um, the uh, uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, the IRGC, uh, especially because we already saw that when the Trump administration assassinated Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian response was uh, virtually nothing. So there's precedent uh, for that, uh, and the Iranians have very little at this point that they can do uh, with, that wouldn't hurt them a hell of a lot more uh, then they can hurt Israel or Israel's allies. So that's where we are right now, um, a war that continues um, to escalate with a lot of suffering on the back of it, an incredibly ineffective U.S. policy um, in the region, uh, and everybody else pretty much sitting on the sidelines. That's it for me, and I'll talk to you all real soon. <music>